All right, so hopefully uh, you got to some sort of screen eventually. It looks something like this. Mine looks different because I have to use an account that's already sort of set up. But just to orient <coughs> yourselves, you should have at the top Google My Business. And then we've got Home, Edit Info, Insights, Reviews, and Photos. This is also one of the reasons why you want uh, a Google Plus page for reviews. You're not going to have reviews uh, on a personal account. Question? I don't have that. You're not going to get this unless you have also a local business. So uh, if you want reviews and to be featured on the Google search, remember when I showed the Google search result, taco shops, that's this. This is getting toward this is getting you toward this. And so your business page on Google is all about that. Now at this point, everyone should be here on home. And um, we've got um, edit info, and we've also got edit on the top right, which seems to be the same thing. So does everyone see an edit info button at the top there? All right, as I just said, either at the top or on the right. Does everyone see an edit button? Okay, so let's click the edit button. And then... Um, there's going to be various things to fill in. This one's already filled in, but do you see business name and maybe address? You're not going to see address if you didn't create a location, so don't worry if you don't see address. But then contact info, that's going to be valuable for you. So even if you don't have a uh, physical location, you probably want some sort of contact information for people to get a hold of you. Category, perhaps, hours, intro. Again, I cannot show exactly the same thing, unfortunately, because people have different accounts and so do I but see if you can find an edit button right there uh, yeah Now, some of you have a screen that looks like mine, and some of you don't. Again, uh, I'm trying to show it as generically as possible for everyone, but I, I can't show it for everyone. For some reason, some of you have a slightly different version, and it is annoying, but uh, you know that's why I'm here to help. So if you see a, a screen that looks a little bit different than mine, but you see these little different boxes, and there it says, edit, edit contact info. 
edit location or whatever it says. And if that's what you want to edit, okay. whatever your says you want to edit. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but that's what we do for that. everyone so uh, again I'm gonna try to show this as best as possible if you're helping your friends and neighbors again please uh, do it in a little quieter way because your voice travels and distracts so uh, some of you when you click edit it shows a different screen mine shows the screen I don't know if I can get it to show exactly what yours is but imagine so I've got a screen like yours maybe that's a little full of little boxes and one is the edit uh, one is the contact, and it says edit. So you would edit your contact info, you would edit your link info, and you might see something that says public, in your circles, etc. If you don't see that again, don't worry. But if you do see something like that, the thing is that the, the, the really cool thing about Google Plus is that you can target your message to those that really would care. So let's say, eventually when we do this, let's say I've got a, uh, a pet shop. And some of the customers that follow me here are cat people, and some are dog people, and some are bird people. So I'm going to post something on Google Plus that is great for the cat people, not so great for the dog people or bird people. So I can post something, and it will target the bird people. Google Plus has a way for you to organize all your followers into circles. That's just their term for, like, you know, a folder. Put all of these people in this folder, in this circle. Put these people in this circle. And we will see that when we share something, we can share a specific thing to a specific group of people. And we have a lot of nuances that we'll get to. But that's what that's saying there. Would you like to show your contact information public or to certain circles or extended circles? And I'll talk about those details of circles eventually. But as a business that you want everyone to find you and everyone to you know, get in contact with you, most likely that contact information you want it public. You don't want to exclude people from finding your business. Later, when we post stuff for specific groups, then I would target it to circles, as we will see how in a little bit. I don't want to spend too much time on you filling in all your information, because you can figure it out and come back to it later. It's going to be back on the home screen under Edit. Your screen doesn't look like mine, unfortunately, but it's in there somewhere. So I'll give you 30 seconds more, and then I'm moving on to other things. You can fill in all that information a little later. Now, um, your Google Plus page has features that a personal profile does not, such as insights. At the moment, you might not have any insights because it's brand new. But let's see if we can kind of get on the same place here. Um, do you see a, 
the, the row of icons at the top here, click on Home. If you don't see this top row of icons, try to first click on the top right corner where your business icon is at and select My Business. So if you don't see a row like I do at the top, first click your icon at the top right and click My Business. So hopefully then everyone sees this. If you still don't see that, look around somewhere on screen that says Try the new Google Plus. Let's go. You might be in the old one. And at the moment, they're transitioning from the old Google Plus interface to the new one. And I'm seeing that with some people, that it keeps taking you back to the old one. All the stuff is still there, just slightly rearranged. But if you see anywhere that says, let's try the new Google Plus, let's go, hit that so that your screen looks the most like mine. On mine, here I see Home, Edit Info, Insights, Reviews. Again, you might not see the exact same thing because you don't have any photos yet, so you might not see photos. You don't have a physical location for people to review, so you don't see reviews. You don't have any traffic to your page, so you don't see insights. Eventually, you'll see something like this. On this particular test account that I have here, I did take a moment to fill in a little bit of info and so forth. And uh, I have a box here of insights. You may or may not, but again, if it's brand new, you're not going to see anything. And later on, I'm going to see my traffic. How many views did I get in the last 30 days? How many times did people click? This is just a test account at the moment, so there's nothing that interesting to look at. But I can show you some of the other clients that there is activity. I shared something. It got responses. People clicked. They bought the product. Insights. You don't see that on a personal profile. You only see this on a business page. Once I know some of this information, then it will help me to make decisions about what's working, what's not, what do I need to try harder on, and so forth. YouTube is integrated to this as well. We'll have a, a two-day lecture on YouTube next month where we talk about creating videos for YouTube and uploading them and getting them found and liked and all of that. You might see about AdWords. AdWords is the place where you can create ads, where you can get your website or Google Plus or YouTube video, whatever, visible more to people when they search online. That's the part that is not free. Everything else that we're doing is free, but if you want to get a leg up on the competition, that's AdWords. We're not going to talk about that in this class. That's a whole huge topic in and of itself, and because it's not free, I'm not going to really get into it because I'm not asking you to take out your credit cards to do this. Depending on your kind of business, you may or may not have reviews. And the thing about reviews, this applies on Google and Yelp and elsewhere. Let me make some notes here. Reviews are valuable. Even bad reviews. Now, you might have heard there's no such thing as bad publicity. Well, to a degree. Bad reviews are bad because someone is not happy with your business. But bad reviews are an opportunity for you to turn them into good reviews. If someone gives you a review on Google Plus that is negative, you will get an alert that says, you just got a review. And then it'll just give you a link. You'll get an alert on your email and it'll, a link back to Google Plus to manage your reviews. There's no reviews here for me to show you, but let's say I had reviews, a negative review. You're then going to have an option below the review that says reply to review. That's your opportunity to turn, you know, to get lemonade out of lemons for you to review, uh, reply to the bad reviews. This applies in Google, this applies on Facebook, this applies on Yelp, on TripAdvisor, whatever place where people give reviews. What I will say about that is take the time to reply to negative reviews to turn them into positive reviews. I will say do not bribe them for good reviews. <laughs> Meaning, someone went to my bakery they said, I bought these cupcakes, I was so happy to buy them, I took them home, there was a cockroach in one. One star. Okay, 
I'm not going to reply and say, we're so sorry, come back, you get a free cupcake next time. I'm not going to say, come back next time, 10% off, we'll make it better. I'm not going to bribe them. I'm not going to give anything away for free at all. It's so tempting to do that. And sometimes you might hear some um, you know, advice or, or tutorials or whatever that say to do that. Don't do that. Don't bribe them. Don't give them something in return because now, unfortunately, you know, always, someone always finds a way to scam the system. People make a living giving bad reviews to get free stuff. Don't be part of the problem. So don't bribe people begging for a good review to come back to you. You're going to instead do something like, here's the do. We're sorry for your bad experience. We have dealt with XXXXX, whatever the problem was. Please come back, or please come again, and see how we've improved. Now, you're going to have to figure out what you need to do to fix that cockroach and the cupcake, but there was an example of a particular client that said, I got home. And I got a bad review on, on Google that someone said, I was at your shop and one of your employees was saying very racist things in the middle of the day. One star. I hope, you know, I hope you, I forgot how they ended it, but they said, you know, is that how you treat your customers? So he called me and said, I just got this terrible review. How do I deal with this? And I said, again, you're not going to give anything away. You're not going to say, please, you know, we're sorry, 10% off, etc." Uh, you're you're gonna perhaps deal with your employee and he said you know that employee I have been looking for a reason to fire her uh, she has been very bad recently and here's a reason and okay I'm gonna fire her and, uh, and then I said on your on your reply you are going to say again we're sorry this does not reflect the views of the business that employee is totally out of line we're sorry she doesn't reflect our uh, our, our, our values and we have dealt with the situation appropriately. Please come again to, please come back to uh, see how we've improved. You know, whatever positive way that you're saying you understand the person's problem, you're going to deal with the problem and you want another chance. But you're not going to say 10% off your, your, your product next time. That is an art and a science, but the big idea is don't give away something for a good review. And also do make your reply public on Yelp, on Google Plus and such. You can reply privately. You want to reply publicly even if it's a negative review because everyone's going to see that negative review. And if you reply positively and privately, no one's going to see you trying to fix it. So if you reply publicly to that bad review, they're going to see, okay, this company's trying. They're not just uh, you know, some heartless corporation, there are actually people there trying and they're replying and maybe, best case scenario, the person then does come back to your business and does have a better review and that one star becomes three stars or four stars or five stars, better than one star or two star. And people will see that you're trying publicly. So this applies here on Google+. Plus. People can review, their, review you there. People can rev review you on Facebook. People can review you on Yelp, etc., etc. We're not going to get to Yelp in this class, but Yelp is something you need to look into, perhaps. Am I on Yelp? Probably, even though you didn't create your own Yelp profile, someone probably went in to review you, and even and especially when it's negative. Unfortunately, people studies show people remember the negative stuff more than the positive. They remember a bad experience more than a good one and they're gonna make sure they get home to give you that bad review. But they're not gonna remember that amazing time they had in your business, uh, that amazing food that they eat, that they ate and that they eat every week and they're not gonna remember to give you the good reviews unfortunately. They're gonna remember the bad ones. So it's up to you to also guide people that have been having a good experience with your business don't forget to review us on Yelp. Don't forget to review us on Google+. Plus. People say, what's Google+. Plus? Well, you know, the savvier people that are using Google+, Plus uh, will do so. You might not have reviews. Eventually you will. Or you might not have reviews if you don't have, uh, you know, a local business, and that's okay. Um, 
So that's some things in general of this screen which you may or may not have, but the longer you use this, the more uh, data you will get. Let's, um, well, any questions on this screen? Let's say then at the top left corner, you should see the three line menu. Click on that. If your side menu is already visible, it's visible. But if you don't see that side menu, click the three lines. You should get a little purple menu here. You got home, edit info, insights, reviews, photos, etc. Same things that we're seeing down here. Add more locations or brand pages that don't have a location. And you should see Google Plus page. Click on Google Plus page. Again, mine's already filled in. I've already gone in and maybe edited some of the design and such. If you hover over this area here and you still have the generic multicolored paper, hover over here, you can change the cover. There's a bunch of built-in designs. I would recommend instead put your own stuff there. Don't use the generic Google branding under the change cover. You don't have to do it now, but think about that eventually. You want to upload your own picture there. Dimensions. I don't know the dimensions. I have to look them up. But you want to put a picture there about your business, some more branding to catch people's attention at some point. You've also got, if you hover over your logo, that uh, I think it's like a little blue present at the moment, but if you want to change that, you can hover over there and at some point upload your own logo. Notice that one is, um, well, mine's got transparency, so it looks like it's floating there, but that there's a little circle right there. If your logo is a rectangle, it's going to cut the edges off and look weird, like we saw on Twitter last time. Theirs was a little square, but it's still not a rectangle. This is also not a rectangle. And that space is a little circle. You have to change your logo so that it fits in a circular size. Uh, that's out of our scope, but you need to use some sort of graphics software to edit that or get your graphics person to make a circular version of your logo. If you do have a physical location and you edited your profile, you can also, if you put a location You'll have the way for people to drive to your location with directions. You, you won't have that if you don't have a physical location. Star, upload, share. There's a few videos attached to this account. Mine says here YouTube. You may or may not have anything there. Don't worry just yet. Reviews. Photos, collections, posts, about. There's that screen. About has those different things that you can edit. So the confusing thing is this screen that we were over here for a dashboard is just kind of to manage the basic details of the account. You're not going to spend too much time on that screen. I'm not going to change my address very often, so I don't need to go back to that screen that often. What you're mostly going to be spending your time on is the actual page, which is this new window that opened up here. Dashboard, and there's the page. I can tell because at the top right corner, <coughs> it's my business. But here's my page. And now you get another different kind of menu here on the left. Well, actually, wait a minute. Uh, I'm seeing Meet the New Google Plus. I'm going to click Let's Go. Again, whenever it says Meet the New Google Plus, try to get to it as soon as you can so that you're using the latest version. Okay, here we go. Same sort of info, slightly different. So in my case, I'm looking at my uh, company info like that, and then I see a back arrow on the top left. Not the back arrow of the browser, but the back arrow inside the red bar. Click on that. Okay, so here then, 
we've, we've spent time setting up this account, and now we're going to start using it very much in the vein of Twitter, uh, in that we're going to post stuff. And we'll talk about the two very effective ways to use Google Plus in a moment. Uh, I want to just get into the habit of how do you post something, how do you use it. Um, you will often see on the bottom right corner a little red pencil that's to share something or sometimes you will see something like what's new with you or whatever they might write there either one of these ways will let me share so the whole purpose of any social network any social network is to share content uh, to get traffic I'm gonna share a photo, a video a poem, a quote, a link, I'm gonna share something to get me traffic because on my website is where I'm gonna sell my cupcakes and so does everyone see a little red pencil on the bottom right corner? I'm, I'm getting confused with all these menus. Alright, so you want to click on your little three lines on the top right corner. And then go to the Google Plus page. And then you want to click on the Let's Go right here. I've done that. All right, so I see some stuff here you may not. That's okay. But you should see a pencil on the bottom right. Click on that. That brings up a little simple sharing window. And what you've got here is, okay, here's my company. Here's my company, <coughs> and I'm sharing this publicly. As I said, we can target our message to specific audiences. For the moment, we will share this publicly. But there's a little area for me to write something. You know, I can write text, and I don't have a limit like Google, uh, like Twitter, in that I have 140 characters to write. I can write that much if I want. No one's going to read it, but I can uh, I can share as much as I want. I can put paragraphs in there and all of that. So I have one paragraph of stuff here. Break it up into another paragraph. Sure, people are not going to spend a lot of time to read your content on the network itself, usually you're going to guide them back to your website. I'll explain what that means in a moment, of course. But let's say one of the basic things we'll share is text. So again, what we learned last week still applies here. Happy to be on Google+, Plus, which is not good enough. Who cares? Remember last week I said, we're on Google+, Plus. follow us for exclusive content. what's in it for people to follow you. Exclusive content. Okay, that seems just like a tweet. Here's one thing that's different in Google Plus that, that's different on all the networks. Google Plus has this but not the others. You can actually add um, a little bit of text styling to your text so that it's not plain. I can bold something, I can italicize something. The way you do that is I'll write it like this. Asterisks equal bold. What that means is that when you wrap an asterisk around when you wrap asterisks around your content, that will become bold. You're not going to see the boldness until you post. So don't worry if it's suddenly not bold. But when you write asterisks around a word or a sentence or whatever, after you post it, it will become bold. Underscores are italics.
underscores. You mark underscore here, everything that follows is italics, and then you stop underscore there. You could wrap those around a whole paragraph. I would not recommend you make a whole paragraph bold, a whole paragraph italics. The point of these styling choices are to highlight things, to make things stand out. If everything is bold, then nothing matters. If a couple of things here and there are bold and stand out, then that's more effective. And you could, if you want to, put, I suppose, bold and italics, but you don't want to do that because that's also a design faux pas. One is for emphasis, the other is for emphasis. Why are you double emphasizing something? <clears throat> Amateur. So you don't want to mix both of them up at once. And there's one more which is not that useful. Dashes equals strike through. That will basically cross out a line. It's not that useful for most of us. Let's say, though, you've written something and we will be able to come back and edit our posts later, unlike Twitter. So let's say I wrote something, I made a mistake, people called me out on it, so I go back to my post and then I cross out my mistake and I write, sorry, we actually meant this. So you could do strike through if you wanted. So just to see how this looks, we can delete this, we can edit it later, we can. For the moment, I'm just going to share this. I'm going to click post. There's other things we can do, but I'll just click post. And I shared this. Now it activates. Asterisks are bold, underscores are italics, and dashes are strike through. You cannot do that easily on the other networks. If I made a mistake, notice this says, I shared this one second ago. As time passes, this, this increases five hours ago, etc. But I shared this, and if I click on the time, it pops open so that I can, you know, further read it. And I get little dots in the corner. These little dots are a menu where I can delete my post, edit my post, and some other things, which we'll look at. Okay, well, no. So let's say I did edit it. You know, I go back in, I click Edit Post, I go back to it. You know, I change it whatever. And then I can click Done, and it edited it. I can then at the top left click the back, and it goes back to the main screen here. So the trick is that you can uh, click on your time of your post to go, to go back to edit it. As I, I've been using Google Plus since about you know since the beginning, the first re week of release in 2012 or 11, whenever it came out. Uh, September or so. I remember Google Plus was in beta testing from around April to September and you could only get into Google Plus with an invitation. And I had gotten an invitation, I said I don't need another social network, I'm already on Twitter and so forth. But now it's my favorite network. After it became public and I heard it to use it, I really like it. I like to use it for personal, friends and family, etc. and I really like it for business. We'll see why it's so effective in a moment. Now very recently they changed to this new interface and unfortunately I don't like it. This new interface is much more complicated. I'm having to help a lot of people about, I'm in the wrong menu, I'm in the wrong screen, what am I doing? That's not your fault. That's Google Plus being schizophrenic at the moment, that there's still the old version and the new version. They should now kick in the new version. Us old-timers hate the new version, but everyone's going to get the new version when they sign up, pretty much. And they still give you the ability to go back to classic Google Plus, which I like better, but they should make a decision and really move on. So unfortunately, some things that used to be more straightforward, I'm seeing that there are more steps, such as you used to be able to edit your post. I made a mistake. 
right away you would get the menu in the corner to do it. Now you have to click on your post to focus on your post, and then click the dots, and now I can edit it. Now that I'm focused on my post, where did everything else go? I have to press back to go to everything else. This is what happen, What happens when you let programmers alone design this stuff and they don't write it through real people. Unfortunately, Google is a lot about that. Google has a lot of a built-in culture of, we can use computers to fix the world, but then they don't get in the designers and the UX people and all of that, and you get sort of this. People who, who uh, set up everything from the original one, is all their information now just converted to the new? Yeah, all the stuff is still there. All the content and what you can do is still there. But now it's been sort of rearranged. You know, it's like someone goes into my kitchen and rearranges my pantry and I can't find anything. It's still there, but I just have to poke around a bit. How did you get back to that point? Did you just click back? Click that, that back button, yes. Do you see a back arrow on the top left? Right there? Oh, there. Yeah. So um, I shared something. It was plain old text. I'm going to go back to this main screen here. You can also always get back here uh, by clicking on home. At least you have this here, home and such. So I'm going to go back to this home screen and I'm going to click the pencil again to see what else I can share. I can attach a photo and I'm not limited to the four photos that I was with Twitter. I can attach 40 photos if I want. There's no limit to the characters like Twitter. You can explore this on your own, but you can click photo, and you can either upload a photo, choose a photo, you can choose multiple photos. I'm not going to do that at the moment. Sharing a photo, it's not that complicated. You just have to have a photo to share. You can attach a link. If I select to attach a link, it's okay, add your link. If I have the, the link off the top of my head, I can type it in. Or let's say I have a link from some other website. I can copy and paste it. Let's say I went over to my um, company's website and I've got a blog post. I want to share one of my blog posts. So all I have to do is copy that address, any address, any link, and I Google Plus you know, I click the little share link icon, that's a chain, like a link, paste it there. And I'm going to share that link, and the cool thing is that it will take that link and it will kind of create a little preview about it, depending what's there. It might, you know, get a little preview graphic, or it might get a little bit of snippet of text, and so it will let you share a, um, a link attached to your post, which you can still add text. Notice now I can no longer add a picture, but I've got that, that link. And I can say something further. Uh, check out our video on how to make your own app. Again, think about content that you're going to share, just like we talked about Twitter, about people that will care about, something that will entice someone to, to watch this, to listen, to share, to comment, to follow you. Let's say I do share that. For some reason on mine it's not sharing it, but usually that'll work. Let's say I did add an, a link and I click post and I shared it, and then what will happen is that uh, I'll see something like this. This company, Engadget, shared this. They wrote a little commentary, and it has a link, and then it goes over off to, their, to that link on that article. The point of sharing a link would be people are not going to want to read that whole article that you wrote. They're going to look at Google Plus or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and browse around, and if something catches your attention, such as this sinking ship here or this Mars rover, then if I really want to read, then I can click, and that'll take me back to their website, 
where I can read the whole 500 words. I can write 500 words on Google+. I don't recommend it. I recommend write some sort of snippet, add the link, and then the people that really want to read that will, will read it. So when we talked last week, I talked about you should balance, and this is up to you, I can't give you any hard numbers, but you should figure out, you should balance posts that are, you know, salesmanship posts, and posts that are just fun, frivolous, not the hard sell. Don't try to always say, click here, buy this, subscribe now, look at this. Don't always try to, you know, convert people. Uh, you want to mix it up. Sometimes something fun, inspirational, an interesting picture, and that's it. Nothing about, and we sell that cupcake. You know, just a picture of a cupcake that, it, that gets people hungry. And then one or two posts later, one day later, whatever, then add another post that, act, that has another tasty cupcake, and then it says, and this is on sale this month. You know, it's an art and a science. It takes practice. The more you do this, the more you get better at it but balance it. And I can't tell you. Make sure on this day you do this, and on this day you do that. And on this week you do this, and on this month you do that. You are going to try what works for you. You may post something once a week on Google+. That's perfectly fine. You may post something once a month on Google+. That's fine. You may post something once a day. That's fine. You might post something every four hours. That's fine. Anything that you do on social media will help you. What won't help you is to not use it will not help you is to create an account and not log in again for three months. Whatever amount, whatever timetable you want to create to log in and use it is fine. And we've already talked about Twitter, so I'm not saying give up on Twitter either. Maybe this week do something on Twitter, and next week do something on Google+. Better yet, do something this week on Twitter, Monday, and do something on Google+, Friday. And repeat next week, and next week, and next week. People then always ask, can I share the same thing? Can I share that same picture and, and text on Twitter and Google Plus? On a technical level, yes. On a more advanced level, maybe. You don't want to share the exact same thing on each network. Because then why would people be enticed to follow you on Twitter and Google Plus? If you're sharing the same thing on both networks, I'll just follow you on Twitter. But if you're sharing something different on one and and compared to the other, it might entice people to follow you on both. More followers could result in more hits and more traffic and such, and more sales, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, that's going to be double your work. Two different things, Monday and Friday, for both networks. In the middle would be that you share, let's say, the same picture on Twitter on Monday and on Google Plus on Friday, but then you write some different text here in a different way. On Twitter, I wrote, sale this Saturday, use this coupon. And on Google Plus, I might share the same picture, but I might say something like, great news, we've got a sale coming up this weekend. Check the coupon and then I put an address to the coupon, or whatever. Very similar content on both shares, slightly different. That way you can, uh, that way you don't have to do double the work. But us, me as part of a company where we do this for various clients, we do often post original content to every network. Yes, it's three times the work, four times the work, that's why they're paying us. You yourself have to run your business and do the social media. There are shortcuts. You know, double your material. I mean, uh, repurpose your material on different networks. And there is a way for us to actually um, manage multiple networks in one interface. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But let's say I'm sharing this, and I can also attach a location. If I allow it to see my location, and if I've created a, if if I've got a location on Google Maps, 
you know, I can then attach it. And the point of that is that someone is on their mobile device, they're following me on Google+, Plus. they see sale this Saturday, where's their store? I'm going to see a map. I can actually follow a map on the social, I mean, on the, on the mobile device if I share location. We'll do one more thing and then we'll take a break. Yes? Is it okay also to announce like an event? Yeah, like definitely. Um, announcing events. There isn't any specific type of event to share, uh, but you can write about an event and write down the address and phone number and everything, any, any way you want to use it. <coughs> so we didn't get to hashtags on Twitter, but we have hashtags here. Basically, a hashtag is a keyword. A hashtag is a keyword that you attach to your tweet or your post on Google+. Hashtags are keywords attached to a post or tweet. The point of that is hashtags are active links. And hashtags help organize you um, into trends. So whenever something happens, let's say the Super Bowl, you might have heard of hashtag SB50, Super Bowl 50. The hashtag SB50 is a keyword that I attached to my tweet. So the point of that is anyone that uses the hashtag SB50 keyword, hashtag, all of our tweets basically are connected together. So if I click the SB50 hashtag on Twitter or Google+, it will show me everyone that is using that hashtag. It'll tap me into everyone talking about that topic on that trend. Unfortunately, there is no sort of like central repository where I can go look up what are the hashtags that I need to look at. There are many websites that do compile them, but this stuff changes all the time. That something that you looked up a week ago might not be relevant anymore. Witness all these movies that come out. Each movie has its own hashtag, then the movie comes and goes and no one uses it anymore. If anyone can make up a hashtag, they're not locked in that you have to buy it or you have to request it. You can make a hashtag. I'm going to post something on Twitter, and I'm going to keep using uh, VB, VB Yum, hashtag VB Yum, Victor's Bakery Yum. That's my hashtag. No one can tell me I can't use it. I can make it up. I can use it on all my tweets, all my Google Plus posts, all my Pinterest posts. I can use hashtags on all the networks. But if I'm the only one using it in the world, is it really helping me? That's why they also say, Hashtag on the news, hashtag KUSI. That's why they say on the radio, hashtag 91X. That's why you see on flyers and ads and stuff, hashtag Saw17 the movie. Because they also that also needs to get attention for people to use it. And again, there are websites that purport to give you uh, collections of hashtags, but this stuff changes all the time. Instead, to figure out what hashtags to use, we can use the network itself to share. I mean, to search. We can search inside of Twitter. We can search inside of Google+, inside of Pinterest. And what that means, you will only see content on those networks. If you do a plain old Google search, a plain old Yahoo search, a plain old Bing search, for a hashtag, it'll give you results on all the networks, it'll give you results on someone's website, it'll give you results all over the internet if you do a plain old search engine search. But if you search in the network, it will only give you content in the network. Let's try that right here. Does everyone see a big old search box at the top here? This is search inside of Google+. Type here, click and then type hashtag SB50 
and stuff might pop up here. You might get some suggestions. Just ignore the suggestions at the moment. Just type hashtag SB15 and press enter. Collections that use that hashtag. Communities that use it. We'll see what the difference are in a moment. Posts from people that have used that hashtag. Michael Savalati, Mayor Ed Lee, Loyalty B, Walker Lawrence. All of these people are using this hashtag in their post. Same concept on Twitter. On Twitter at the top right we had a sh search box. I would start typing in a hashtag. It might give me suggestions. Those suggestions might be useful to you because you could see if it's suggesting this to me, I might want to use that hashtag to be found easier. Because hashtags are a way to organize your posts to be found when someone searches. All of these people are using that hashtag. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, again, that's not a relevant hashtag anymore. So we're all looking for SB51. Two days ago, seven days ago, four weeks ago, etc. Let's try it like this. I'll go back to the top here, search. Let's search hashtag, I got Victor's Bakery. Let's search hashtag cookies. <coughs> I might get some suggestions. I'll ignore them for the moment. These results appear, these communities, and then all of these posts. Five hours ago, Bake Cake shared, who doesn't love the smell of freshly baked vanilla cookies? Enticing picture, and then a link. I'm showing you here. I'm showing you here that what you want to do is share content. You know, get inspiration from the competition, and then see what they're doing. And maybe I get an idea here. Look at this. This is very creative. Someone is showing a little video of actually making the cookies. I don't know how to do that, but that's something I want to learn how to do one day. And maybe share that because I like that. I'm seeing it. Maybe. <coughs> Maybe I will want to do something like that someday. Is that like some kind of app for these TI hashtags? Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of apps out there, and you can look up GIF GIF apps, GIF creating apps. And so. I'm making everyone hungry here, but here's the example. Then I'm searching for these for this hashtag, <coughs> this keyword, and if I want to do it myself, I'm going to click back on home. I'm going to click the little pencil. I'm going to write um, something like uh, exclusive. Um, free web design consultation. Use coupon hashtag free web design. So to make a hashtag, you just write the hash mark, the pound symbol, the number symbol, which is shift three. And then you write a, a word, a simple word or a phrase. But the catch is no spaces, no symbols. So I would not write hashtag free space web design. The only hashtag that I created is the word free. Hashtag free. That's not what I'm going for. I'm going for hashtag free web design. So no spaces, no dashes, no dots, no apostrophes. What if I wrote hashtag cats cradle. I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, pet shop and I want to get across the hashtag cat's cradle. The only hashtag here is cat, not cat's cradle, because that symbol then broke it and it's no longer hashtag cat's cradle. You have to avoid spaces, you have to avoid 
special characters. You can put capitalization, that doesn't matter. So I could do free web design, that's fine. Capital lowercase doesn't matter. What matters is no spaces, no special characters. So the question is, can I use someone else's hashtag, basically? Um, yes, if someone else invented the hashtag, I can use it as well. I, I, I'm not prevented from that. The only issue is that if someone else is using it is perhaps and is perhaps more famous than you, then they'll still get the traffic rather than you. They're sharing something, and every time they share something, they use their hashtag. And when someone sees the hashtag, they're going to see their stuff, because they're sharing something every day. And you're sharing something once a week. So your content will be drowned out because I'm in a hashtag that's too popular. Because previously you were showing the screen, and so we're all using the same hashtag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You can use any hashtag, but uh, if you use hashtags that, are, that perhaps are too popular, you'll get drowned out. Everyone else is going to be sharing stuff, and you will be pushed down lower and lower. Question? For people, like, if I use, like, a popular hashtag, automatically, like, if my name is not popular, it will not be also because it doesn't have a lot of people see it. Well, yes and no. You will be part of the crowd. It's like, are you going to hang out in real life with people that are popular? You'll Some of that popularity will rub off on you, sure. But then the more of the f uh, fame and attention will be to the popular people that are more popular than you. So you will get some residual popularity and hits and views and such. But if there's a hashtag that has so much activity, you're going to get drowned out. Your posts will be pushed down lower as new ones appear and appear and appear. Question. Um, would you recommend having a hashtag for your own business name? And if so, how would you use that for your marketing purposes? Well, like I said earlier, that you need to get attention for your particular unique hashtag <laughs> in as many places as possible. So let's say I were writing, um, let's say I put in a photo of the, let's say I put in a photo of the company, and I say, great job, team, right? I'm not selling anything. But then I put hashtag, uh, you know, vbake. I made up my own hashtag. Okay, and I'm going to use that over and over and over. Great. How do I get more attention for that is I keep using it over and over, and I also use it on Twitter and Facebook and Google+, and when I give people my business card, it's on there, and when I do that radio ad, I mention it, and when I put that flyer on people's windows, I have it there. So for us, starting off, it's a bit of an uphill battle to get attention and fame for that hashtag. We're no one, unfortunately. But as we use this more often, and maybe we do have other avenues, maybe we go to networking meetings, and maybe we do run radio ads, well, I have other avenues to get fame for that hashtag. So just use it as much as possible, and uh, you'll start to build uh, fame for it. Yes? Very good point. Another way to get attention for that is have your followers, your friends and family, use it as well. Incentivize people, perhaps. Post something that says, hey everyone, share your best cupcake photo. Don't forget to hashtag it, vbake. And I'm getting my followers to help me make that hashtag popular. Because I can only go so far. I have got seven followers. But maybe one of those seven followers has 700 followers. And they got in on the action and posted a, a photo of their ha of their great cupcake that they made themselves, and they tagged it with my hashtag, and so that helps me spread my hashtag. I have a question. You probably already said this, but what are your limitations on the number of characters in the hashtag? No care. No limitations okay. on Google Plus. There's no limitations on anything that you write. The problem is if I have hashtag the original victors. Bakery San Diego, no one's going to type that. No one's going to type your hashtag to help you out with it. Um, so keep them short and simple and direct, and that makes sense. And um, unfortunately, a lot about what social media, all networks, a lot of it really is about short attention spans. And so I see this article here and 
you know, there's a little dot, 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 read more, I probably won't read it. If I don't get the gist of it on the first little preview, I'm moving on. Maybe you are not like that and you read every single thing. Great. But a lot of people are like that, that they just read a snippet, doesn't catch my attention, I'm moving on. And so, keeping it short and direct, having maybe an interesting picture, and maybe you do want people to read your 500-word political rant. So put a little preview of it, and then a link to read the rest. And for your hashtags, people often also <laughs> ask, well, how many can I put? If one hashtag will get me some traffic from one topic, why don't I put 10 more? You could, but I don't recommend it. Same thing on Twitter. I'm going to say here, hashtags, three or less. Don't put five hashtags, ten hashtags, twenty hashtags. <coughs> At a certain point, it's very spammy. <coughs> I believe you're not a spammer. Other people won't. Google won't. Twitter won't. If you're using the techniques of spammers, which is to fill their post with 20 hashtags and a picture and a link of buy that fake authentic Rolex watch, you're a spammer. So three or less. If you can get your point across with one hashtag, great. If you need two, okay. Three? Don't go more than three. Because you're then diluting your message. You're trying to reach too many people at once. And the thing about good advertising, good marketing, good social media is that you're re reaching for a specific audience. Your product or brand or company or band or whatever is really for a particular target audience. And it's great to say everyone will love my cupcakes. No, not everyone with that nut allergy or a gluten intolerance or not, you know, people that don't like sugar and so forth. So of course there's a target audience for my cupcakes, for my decadent triple layer chocolate, chocolate cupcake. So if you're trying to target a lot of people with seven hashtags, you're targeting no one. You're not <clears throat> specifying. Let's take one more quick break. When we come back, we'll look at collections and communities, because that's the big secret to really get attention on Google+. Hashtags are good. Collections and communities are better. On Twitter, hashtags are really good. We'll do a quick five minutes because we're getting close to the end of the day. So not ten minutes. We'll be back at 12.05 and then we'll go on.